Hello and a very warm welcome to this video roundtable from the APAC Insights content team at Sightline, a North Stellar company, in which we're aiming to provide something a little different from our usual written and audio content on the Asia Pacific pharma and biotech industry for Scrip and the Pink Sheet. We thought it would be informative to give viewers some top line takes on the current hot biopharma themes within the markets where the team has on the ground presence, namely China, India, South Korea and Japan, as a way of highlighting what we see as significant from our perspective. This might be a little different from the outside global coverage of the region. But in any case, the intention is to identify and talk a little bit about the key developments, challenges and opportunities within each of these markets. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to the regional team, which I will do in order of speaking today. Firstly, we have the China team, managing editor Brian Yang in Beijing and senior editor Dexter Yan in Shanghai. Next, our India team, both based in Mumbai. APAC executive editor Andrew Gangurdi and senior editor Viva Ravi. Senior editor Jungwon Shin in Seoul, South Korea. And last but not least, Lisa Takagi, who's our managing editor based in Tokyo, Japan. So we'd like to kick off by taking a look at the dynamic China market and some of the recent policy and commercial trends there. So over to you, Brian and Dexter. Thank you. I wish you have a good day out there. Um, I'm Brian Yang. I'm the managing editor uh, for China coverage for Sideline Scrap Pink Shape. First, um, as Yen just kindly introduced, uh, there are many challenges, but also opportunities in the China pharma market. Recently, we have noticed the latest, but also the most wide ranging in compliance crackdown to date is right now happening in China. It covers all three sectors of the healthcare sector. First, healthcare products such as pharma, medtech and medical consumables. Also health services and health insurance sector. The enforcement campaign investigates the whole chains of each of the sectors. Today, I'd like to bring you quickly go through this, uh, the crackdown, the, 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 the most wide ranging and massive anti-corruption campaign, uh, cap, uh, campaign right now happening in China quickly. Well, in comparison, the last major crackdown, which took place in 2015, was mainly focused on bribery in farmer commercial activities. The current uh, crackdown, however, not only impacted the farmer medical device sectors, but also professional and medical associations, and it affects both commercial activities and centralized procurement process. The targeted areas include fraud, bribery, and interest rent sinking. China's National Health Commission on August 15 issued a guideline setting the stage for the crackdown to focus on six key areas, which includes cash for sales practice by a critical few, interest rent sinking, and transfer benefits with physician conferences and academic meetings. So far, over 10 national and regional physicians conferences have been canceled, postponed or suspended. The campaign is led not only by the National Health Commission, but also by influential China Communist Party's disciplinary department along with eight other authorities. The next stage of the crackdown is moving, as we are speaking now, to provisional and the municipal levels. So, in particularly, how does the anti-corruption campaign impact drug-making sector for now? Although 
as I said earlier, the emphasis of uh, the crackdown is the cash for sales and a critical fuel, which indicates that the Chinese authorities wanted to keep the crackdown focused and prevent it from spreading out of control. But however, there's a little explanation about what conferences is legal or legitimate. So now organizers just suspended almost all conferences or conferences altogether. So meanwhile, a farmer company's regional office was raided and the PCs and the files were confiscated. And over 100 hospital presidents and party secretaries nationwide are being placed under investigation. Medical sales reps in many cities were put on leave. And even in a real case, Shanghai Changzhen Hospital even asked Swiss drug maker Novartis to reprimand two sales reps due to related violations. Because the last quarter, always, always the peak season, the peak season for product sales, pharma companies and medical device makers are likely to see their performance affected by this commercial disruptions. Meanwhile, domestic Chinese drug makers have openly supported the latest campaign. They say that the rooting out corruptions and the making the sector more compliant is beneficial to the healthy development of industry in the long term. Lastly, let me just talk briefly, what are some key takeaways from the, this massive, the biggest ever anti-corruption campaign to date in China? First, key, key takeaway is that cash for sales is the major focus. Secondly, large-scale commercial activities halt it or get severely disrupted. And the physicians' visits, academic meetings are all being scaled back or canceled for the time being. Many expected the crackdown to last over the remainder of 2023 and well way into the 2024. And Compared with the R&D expenses, marketing expenses still account for a lion's share among Chinese pharma companies. So that means many rely heavily on high sales activities to sell drugs. So with the, the massive, potentially multi-year anti-corruption campaign overhand the sector, the importance of compliance becomes even more important than ever for the health sector in the foreseeable future. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for that, Brian. All right, over to you, Dexter, please. Yeah, hey, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Dexter Yan and uh, speaking from Shanghai. So uh, let's just talk about uh, earnings because it's just like everywhere else in China and the last few weeks of August is the uh, busiest season of earnings reporting. So, uh, so far we know that in the first half of this year, three Chinese biotechs and biopharmers, they have booked half year profits for the first time. And they are Shanghai Handlers Biotech, Akiso, Harbor Biomed. So meanwhile, most of their domestic peers are still operating in the red as the first, uh, as their first half revenues, some are nominal or even zero, can't offset the costs, including those spent on IND. The three companies I just mentioned that, um, however, they have brought good tidings from the field, especially when the domestic pharma industry is currently caught in a feeling of depression, either the because of the anti-corruption campaign Brian has just mentioned, or the steep price reductions um, imposed by the government-led price negotiations. But uh, yeah, anyway, we have some good news from, from them. So firstly, let's take a look at uh, the sources of their profits. Um, for Shanghai Henley's Biotech, 
the company estimated earlier that uh, uh, roughly $27 million in profit, uh, which is thanks to strong sales of its uh, two pr approved products. So Hanlin is most well known for its biosimilar business outside of China. It is truly a major source of profits. Hanlin is accepting biosimilar Hanqiu contributed significantly to the first half profit with improved profitability, according to the company. Over the past years, Henlius has also been developing its own innovative drug business. Its PD-1 antibodies, Surplutimed, was approved in China in March 2022 and increased its revenue in the first half of this year. And in the case of Akiso and Harbor Biomed, Akiso predicted that it turned a profit of not less than 350 million US dollars. Uh, it's a quite a big deal, uh, big number. So Harbor's, Harbor's profit was recorded at between 2 million US dollars and 4 million US dollars. The two companies turned around mainly due to one off gains from out licensing deals. Um, and we still remember that Akiso has teamed up with US Biotech Summit Therapeutics. And Harbor has partnerships with US firm Carlina Oncology and another domestic major, CSPC Pharmaceutical Group. Um, I think uh, just because uh, Akizo has uh, struck a very big a mega deal with Summit Therapeutics in December, and uh, Akizo has booked uh, a total of five, 500 million US dollars in upfront payment from Summit Therapeutics and all a major a, most of the part of the um upfront payment has been booked in the first half in Akiso's first half results so so and if, let's just look back look back at all the positive news uh, the positive results from the three companies so so what does this new development mean to the Chinese biotech sector, and uh, what more can we expect from these fledgling companies? Um, from my point of view, that for Chinese biotechs, profitability is still a probability rather than just a possibility. And just as the three companies have proved that there's no reason to lose confidence in China's biotech sector's long-term robust growth, um, because they have already proved that revenue or even profitability can be achieved by either selling drugs, out licensing rights to their drugs, or by a combination of these two approaches. So when we um, just say goodbye to the second quarter result and uh, look, look forward to the three quarters and uh, the third quarter or the, uh, the rest the rest of this, this year, I think uh, more positive news will be just coming our way. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Dexter. All right, let's move over to India now. And Andrew, what are some of the key top line trends that you've been observing from that market recently? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Uh, so I'm Anju Bhangate, Executive Editor for the Asia Pacific Region for Strip and Pink Sheet. Uh, We've just had Indian companies announce their fiscal first quarter earnings, and I'd like to spotlight some of the few common trends across uh, the top firms, uh, essentially Sun, Cipla, and Dr. Reddy's. Now, the first key trend was an impressive run in the U.S. by all three firms. We actually saw Sun's U.S. formulation sales go up uh, 12 percent. Cipla, in fact, reported its highest ever quarterly revenue in the U.S., with 43% growth. And Dr. Reddy's took it one notch higher with its North America revenues up a whopping 79%. Uh, what's interesting is that all three firms had gains from generic rev limit. Uh, Sun, in fact, expects generic rev limit to be more episodic going forward. I think more widely, what's important is that the commentary suggested that uh, price erosion in the US may have tempered a bit and this is amid the wider churn that we are seeing. Uh, I'm referring to sell-offs, bankruptcy, shortages, and even a balancing of the uh, supply chain. 
I'd also just like to quickly add that, you know, Q1 saw an interesting dimension with Dr. Reddy's joining hands with billionaire entrepreneur Mark Cuban's cost plus drug company to expand access to essential drugs for Wilson disease patients. That will be really worth keeping an eye on given the strides Cuban's venture has made in various uh, you know, drug uh, alliances. Now, the second distinct trend that uh, I could uh, pick out was the China interest and the China commentary. Uh, now, Dr. Reddy's, which had, has had a long-standing presence in China, appeared to be the most buoyant of the lot. Its uh, product approval rates in China match the best-in-class companies in the generic space. Uh, Sun, on the other hand, has a long-standing uh, licensing deal with China Medical System Holdings for its specialty products, Illumia, Sequoia, and then certain uh, generics. And it's just received NMPA approval for Illumia. If we go to Cipla, Cipla has a plant in Quidong, and uh, which it has successfully commissioned during 2021-22. That site has just received a manufacturing license, setting it up nicely for you know, potential regulatory filings, even for the US and other emerging markets. But uh, you know, as my colleague Brian said, it remains to be seen if China's latest commercial compliance crackdown and the ongoing geopolitical tensions could temper some of the enthusiasm more widely across industry and probably you know, among some of the top rung Indian firms. Uh, the final bit I'd like to quickly touch upon is biosimilars. Both CIPLA and Dr. Reddy's have made clear that biosimilars is a really important prong of their future strategy. I won't get into the specifics now, but markedly, Sun has actually looked the other way and said that it remains tentative about this segment, given significant investments that may be required in individual products that may be along the lines of what it invests in developing a specialty product. So interesting times ahead, but also one that could uh, you know, require some recalibration of strategy. Uh, so with that, it's a wrap on some of the key highlights and sidelights of the earning seasons. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks very much for those insights, Anju. Um, all right, over to you, Viva, for uh, some other views on the Indian market developments recently. Sien, hi, this is Vibha, senior editor. And today I'm going to talk about the draft Red Tape Elimination Act a bill that has been reintroduced by Senator Mike Lee and a few fellow senators in the US. Now, the bill aims to remove the requirement of switching studies for a biosimilar to receive an interchangeable designation. We will come to the impact this could have, but first, let's just take a brief look at why this matters. It should matter to the uh, public, that is the patients in the US and to biosimilar companies in uh, across the world, including in APAC, just as my colleague mentioned, Henlius, we have Celtrion, we have Sandoz, we have uh, several companies from India that include Cipla, Lupin, etc. We know biologics have been gaining importance, particularly in the fast growing therapeutic areas of oncology and immunology. The global biologics market is estimated to be about 400 to 450 billion dollars in 2023. In 2019, Biologics accounted for over $200 billion in U.S. prescription drug spending, which is a whopping 43% of the total spend. This amount is only going to increase given that most of the research at leading pharmaceutical companies is focused on biologics and large molecule drugs. Now, pharmacists can substitute generics for their branded counterparts as far as small molecules are concerned. But with biosimilars and interchangeability status permits pharmacy level substitution subject to state pharmacy laws. While this substitution, substitution could still occur for biosimilars without the, this designation of interchangeability, it requires the pharmacist to contact the prescriber who then must approve it. This designation has been elusive. Currently, the US FDA website shows 41 approved biosimilars, and so far only four have an interchangeability label. Uh, as my colleague also mentioned, you know, Sun 
uh, pharma has been skeptical of entering into this area uh, because of the costs associated with it. McKinsey's analysis shows a typical biosimilar costs 100 to 300 million dollars to develop and takes six to nine years to go from the lab to approval. An interchangeability study only adds to this you know, trial complexity, costs and timelines, given that it requires patients to be switched back and forth from a reference product to the interchangeable biosimilar. This has meant that the world's largest pharmaceutical market, which is the US, has lagged Europe in biosimilars uptake. In 2019, Europe accounted for an estimated 87% of global sales. So what would happen if biosimilar uptake in the US improves? Data from IQIA and the Association of Accessible Medicines show that in 2021, generic and biosimilar drugs generated a record $373 billion in savings for the US healthcare systems. Uh, system. Biosimilars already in use have typically launched with initial list prices 15 to 35% lower than list prices of the reference products. Besides, Originator companies themselves reduce prices of reference products once the biosimilars are introduced. It's not that the regulator is unaware of the benefits. In 2022, the US FDA granted an interchangeability designation to coheres uh, sorry to coheres biosciences similarly, which is a biosimilar to uh, Lucentis. Uh, this was granted for all five indications without switching studies. But opposition to the bill can be expected from Big Pharma as patents for 17 major biologics are set to expire over the next decade, opening the door for biosimilar competition. What happens here on is anybody's guess, but it's going to be an interesting field to watch, and we are keeping track of the developments as they unfold. So watch out. OK, Viva, thanks very much for those insights. All right, we're now moving over to Northeast Asia and uh, to Korea with Jung Won. Uh, I'm a senior editor based in Seoul, and I'm going to talk briefly about Korean company strategies to enter the US market, as well as some investor views and government support. Korean biopharma firms are more aggressively entering the U.S. market in various forms as the global deal-making and investment sentiment remained weak. As an example, Boston was crowded with Korean people during the Bio International Convention Week. This year's Bio International Convention saw the strongest ever participation from Korea. Various receptions organized by the Korean government agency and other organizations took place during that time, and they were also packed with Korean companies, investors, and global big pharma firms, reflecting strong interest from potential partners and investors. In line with this fervor to enter the U.S. and other global markets to grow into top-tier pharma companies, Korean companies are also coming up with new strategies and roadmaps. Among them, Dell has established Dell Innovation Holdings in Boston a couple of years ago uh, with the goal of facilitating the pharma firm to enter the U.S. market. Dell Innovation Holdings President Thierry O uh, has recently told Script that Korean companies should not enter the U.S. just because others are doing it. It takes more time, money, and effort than you might think to enter the U.S. market so they need to carefully consider their goals and make plans for how they will achieve them. Uh, since establishment of Adel Innovation, the company has already progressed about 10 collaborations with U.S. biotechs and research institutions. Doha ST is having its Boston-based subsidiary Neurobo Pharmaceuticals as a global R&D base to speed up global development and commercialization of uh, some of key new drug projects. The U.S. operation will also make efforts to reach external partnerships in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, meanwhile, there seems to be growing interest from foreign investors for the Korean life science sector. For example, Orange Grove Bio has identified Korean opportunities at the top of its list in exploring global expansion 
and reached new strategic collaborations with two universities in Korea. The government's more aggressive efforts to promote the biopharma industry to foreign investors, as shown in the meeting between Korean delegation as well as foreign investors, including Novo Holdings, in the U.S. earlier this year, may help increase further interest from foreign investors who hadn't been much aware of the Korean situation and technologies. The Korean government agency Kitty is also stepping up support for Korean companies to enter the U.S. Within the Cambridge Innovation Center in the Boston BioCluster, Kitty has set up a CND incubation office to help provide about 20 Korean companies with offices at CIC and also various other support. That's it. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Jungwon. So finally, over to Lisa in Tokyo to talk a bit about Japan. Hi, this is Lisa Degagi. I'm a managing editor based in Tokyo, Japan. I'm covering both pharmaceutical regulation and market trends in Japan for Pink Sheet and Scrip. Last quarter, main Japanese firms such as Takeda, Daichi Sankyo, Chugai, Eizai, Astellas, Shionogi all showed stable performance, thanks to globally positive performance of their mainstays such as Takeda's Antibio, Chugai's Actimura, Astellas' Padserv, and so on. The first Japanese-made COVID therapeutic, Dakuba, by Shinogi marked 100 billion yen sales because of government's buyout. Hope for new drugs such as menopause drug Veoza by Astellas and Alzheimer therapeutic Lekembi by Azai and Biogen have been also huge. As more and more firms collaborated with overseas bioventures for new drug, some of the Japanese very traditional firms, such as Chugai, also found also recently found a new, uh, new collaborative sites in Boston, United States. Let's take a closer look at Japanese farm market. It has been facing two hot topics. The first one is stabilizing drug supply in shortage. Another one is a change in reimbursement models for COVID therapeutics and vaccines. So, Japan has suffered drug shortage for a couple of years, especially generics. This included several essential drugs such as antibiotics and antipyretics. The Japanese government has been discussing how to change the generic industry structure with healthier profit models. Apparently, many KOLs in the industry have pointed out that the crisis was triggered by both global supply chain crisis in the pandemic and Ukraine's crisis. And, sorry, as many firms have relied on foreign supply. Another reason was Japan's really low pricing models for generic drugs that basically drove generic firms to cut down manufacturing costs to survive. Also, the government have offered financial supports for pharma recently to build domestic manufacturing sites for raw materials for antibiotics especially. This covers half of the cost of building and furnishing the sites within 3 billion yen, which is around $20 million. Let's look at the change in reimbursement model for COVID-related plants, uh, COVID-related products, sorry. Japan used to offer the full coverage for vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19, but the government plans to end the full reimbursement by September. This means from October, people in the country may have to pay 30% of the reimbursement price of therapeutics and vaccines. Because the price for these products are very high, this can impact both the patients and the firms. For example, Shionogi Therapeutic Zokova costs around 50,000 Japanese yen. And this means one patient will have to pay around $150 out of pocket for the, just for the therapeutic. Considering the balance of accessibility for the drugs and financial state of the national health, infrastructure, national health insurance system, the regular discussions has been going on and we expect some updates soon in September. That's all for now. Back to you, Ian. Okay, thanks very much, Lisa. 
So, okay, thank you very much, everyone. And um, <clears throat> I think what has really come across today when we're looking at APAC as a region um, is that we've got a very diverse set of operating environments due to quite large variations in factors such as healthcare systems, payment systems and, and reimbursement uh, programs and so on, as well as regulatory frameworks and then also strategy within the individual industry within each country. So one of the key things that we always emphasize uh, for these reasons is that APAC really cannot and should not be viewed as a homogenous region. And we hope that the, the in-depth and analytical and insightful coverage that this team provides enables our customers to better understand and in turn adapt their own strategies to the very unique and individual markets across the region. So with that, we'll wrap up things today. Many thanks for joining us and do please visit the Script and Pink Sheet websites to find out more and there's some links in the description below or visit sightline.com or norstella.com to find out more about our mission of guiding you from pipeline to patient and the wide range of our brands and solutions. So thank you again and bye for now.